Now, Miguel Delaney of the London Independent is with us. Hiya, Miguel. How you get on? Very well. One of the lads was saying to me you were just interviewing Mason Mount this afternoon. How yeah. was that? Yeah. Uh, he was in decent form. He's quite a, a nice, chirpy young lad. Of course, uh, it's embargo till five o'clock on Friday, I think. I'll, I'll, it's just to reveal details of it will be to come under pain of death from some of my colleagues over here in the, uh, in the UK press. But, uh, but he is, I've interviewed him before, actually. Um, right. Right. Before they played West Ham in November, a game they actually lost, the two clubs did a joint thing with uh, Mount and Declan Rice, our own Declan Rice, if you want to call him that, mm -hmm. because they've been childhood mm -hmm. friends. Um, now, that's, even at the time, that felt actually more of a, a Chelsea event than a West Ham event, because it was even held near Chelsea's training ground. Uh, so I wonder how much that will feed into... Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> Chelsea obviously wants Declan Rice now. You forget Mason Mount has been at Chelsea since the age of six. It's a fairly extraordinary route through life. He's 21 now. And, yeah. You know, he's getting mad, really. Has, it, has Mount always, you may have heard growing up, even as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old and onwards, was Mount always regarded as the big one, somebody who was going to make it? I don't think so, but mostly because, if you, I mean, if you consider it, for most of his. Um, career really or most of his time as a youth graduate Chelsea had become infamous for being unable to bring through another John Terry or another another graduate and that didn't really change until um, last season or until this season sorry with Lampard bringing through the likes of Mounts so that was always I suppose the kind of the doubt there and I, I, I'd, I'd be one of these people I wouldn't go overboard on the job that Frank Lampard has done and I don't think the squad was as bad as many made out at the start of the season but one thing he has done well is integrate players like Mount. Well, he's, he's ended up playing over 50 games this season, scoring over 10 goals. Uh, it's it's decent going, to be fair. Yeah, well, we'll catch that on Friday for sure. That issue of Lampard and just how good a job or how distinctly average a job he's doing has been a real debated point all year. I fall into the category of thinking he's done a, you know, a very decent job. I mean, it almost feel you kind of feel like you, you, you can't say that at this stage and that he's been given too easy a ride from his mates in the punditry box. But... I mean, he's been juggling a fair amount. I would say it's an absolutely, perfectly promising first year. I mean, he got the job, of course, in many respects, by dint of being Frank Lampard, and that's part of the story for sure. But since he's gone in there, I think it's been very acceptable. Do you take a slightly dimmer view? No, I think that's fair enough. Uh, it's probably, you'd say, on the whole, it's a good job. Uh, I, would, like, I mean, there have been times when it's presented as some sort of miracle. Uh, yeah. Now, again, again, yeah. That, 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 I think that maybe that's relative to maybe how how Lampard is seen in the UK. Uh, but I, yeah, I think you have to accept. Yeah, I think there are still flaws as a manager. Yeah, and it, and it is amazing to think about. It. I mean, for all we're, we're talking about the youth of players like Mount or Tammy Abraham, Lampard's managerial career is actually still shorter than say Mount's first team career mm -hmm. or Tammy Abraham's first team career, uh, which kind of puts a certain perspective on things. And I think. Well, Lampard, you can see, he obviously has quite, quite a specific idea of football, but one may, maybe because he's still a young manager, one that's still a little bit underdeveloped because it still has flaws in it, but one of those being how often Chelsea are caught on the break. I mean, they conceded 54 goals this season, which, actually, which is an incredible number, really. Um, but maybe that's natural for a manager uh, that young. Uh, and on the whole, um, he's been a success this season. I want to get your thoughts on the Man City cast judgment in full and the transfer window that we're anticipating. But first, it's worth taking a beat and getting your thoughts on the football season that was. The COVID situation looms large and Liverpool's amazing season looms large. But in general terms, the quality of football, the style of football that we're seeing, where is the Premier League in 2020? Yeah, I didn't think it was a great season. I thought it was actually maybe, I mean, obviously taking into account what Liverpool did, and what happened with COVID. But I actually thought it was the worst season since 2014-15 in that it felt there wasn't... We, when we look back at it, bar those two remarkable things, what, 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 will, people, what will people see? Uh, there wasn't that much to start out. And I think that what, what sums it up is the fact that Chelsea and Manchester United basically kind of squeezed into the Champions League places, having not been very good themselves for long stretches of the season. Well, Chelsea were actually, to be fair more wildly inconsistent. Like, they often go from kind of one very bad game to one very good game, whereas United went from really bad streaks to really good streaks. But I think, like, the, the points thresh, like the points totals they got to get into the Champions League are very low in comparison to other seasons. 
And I think it is slightly depressing. I, 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 this is, I think, one of the main lessons of the season. Despite a campaign that was supposed to be about old orders being upset, Wolves, Sheffield United and Leicester, what ends up happening at the very end, the four wealthiest clubs in England, or at least the, clubs, the, the four clubs with the greatest financial potential or financial power, end up finishing in the top four places. I, like, I did a big piece in February about this whole subject. I think it's becoming a real problem for football, certainly in the context of Juventus winning their ninth title in a row, Bayern their eighth, PSG the six out of the last seven. Uh, I think money is dictating the game to a greater degree than ever before. A worry is that the long-term fallout of this COVID crisis might make it worse. And I think that's been one of the lessons of the season that isn't being fully appreciated yet, and which is really natural because of just how bizarre the last four months have been in, in the context of what is a, a serious real-life crisis. And do you, what, how does the general standard of football across the 20 teams, in your opinion, compare with, say, five years ago? See, I think that's... I kind of re always wrestle with this because I actually think the standard of football is, is certainly at the top teams, is probably close to the highest we've ever seen it. But that's a natural consequence of basically more and more resources being concentrated at the top end of the game. Mm. But that means that maybe the quality of games isn't as high because oh, there, there are too many mismatches. Um, and I think we have a situation where if one of the wealthy teams gets it right, they have the platform and the gap to really go on these massive streaks, which we've seen. We've seen with Chelsea four years ago, with Manchester City for the two of the last three, and then with Liverpool this season. Uh, and I think that that's a problem. Uh, but, but when they get it right, it means we see a very, very high level. And I think uh, it's that's been an issue with the Champions League as well. It's, and it's why the Champions League knockouts have been, I think, basically the highest level of sport anywhere uh, and, and certainly that the football's ever seen in the last few years because it's essentially, it's essentially just it's, uh, it's these endless clashes between these elite clubs with, with so many resources, so much coaching talents uh, but then they stand in contrast to certainly the Champions League group stages which often involve a lot of mismatches and a lot of their domestic leagues as well It's outrageously good, I mean I can't wait for August What about the argument that Man City for instance have lost nine times this year and so yes when a top club really gets it right, they're virtually unstoppable. But to get it really right is difficult. And alongside that, the quality and the technical quality of players we see across the league is better than ever. I mean, if anything, it's a bit homogenised. Every single team seems to play with split centre halves and tries to play a possession-based game in the main. The days of Wimbledon disruptors are largely behind us. So from a technical point of view, uh, it is, you know, the Premier League is no longer looking over at La Liga and feeling on a, on a you know, on a median level way behind. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, and also, I suppose if you look, even even four years ago, the standard bottom half manager were basically these coaches on the carousel, which are basically Pardew, Poulos, Allardyce, Hodgson as well, um, Nigel Pearson. Now, mm -hmm. some of them are obviously still around, but basically there's fewer of them, and uh, almost a lightning rod for that was how Brighton took to, many at the time called it harsh, I think it was a perfectly rag, uh, rational and fair risk to discard our own Chris Uton and go for someone more modern and progressive in, uh, in, in Graham Potter. Uh, but that's very much the standard, for the most case, across the division now, that more and more teams are going for these progressive, and not just in the Premier League, actually. We'll see it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, the playoff after, after we finish this call. Um, but in... in, in in terms of uh, the championship as well, you look like at clubs like Brentford, uh, to a lesser degree Fulham maybe, but certainly who Brentford are playing, Swansea, right down in the championship now, down to Barnsley, they all have this more progressive modern approach, involves a lot of pressing, as you say, innovations like splits and their halves, and that is very much the standard in the game now, in contrast to kind of maybe more reactive defence-based coaches like Hodgson or even Pearson. I suspect you've seen that Graham Hunter documentary on Barcelona, Take the Ball, Pass the Ball. It was on Sky Sports last night, so maybe a lot of listeners might have caught it again. And it's just come back to me now. I was watching a bit of it. And Victor Valdez paints the scene of when Guardiola first takes over and he calls Valdez into a meeting and he shows him the tactics board. And there are three pieces on it. There is the goalkeeper, i.e. that's you, Victor. And then there are two players right next to him, to his left and his right. And he says to Valdez, Who, what position are those two players? And Valdez has no idea. And Guardiola says, they are your centre halves. And this is a mind-blowing thing for Valdez that this is the way they're going to embark. And 
I guess it's, it's a, a reflection of the speed of communication now that here we are, what, 10 years later? And it's everywhere. You know, I, in, in some ways it's wonderful. And I now, you know, you can watch a game between Norwich and Crystal Palace and see lots of intricate patterns and great football. I, I do wonder, is it a bit too homogenized? And, you know, styles make fights and all that. Sometimes, ah, geez, it might be a bit of crack to watch Wimbledon go in and try and smash a few lads up. That's, I've thought that myself. I, say, I think styles make, make fights is, is a perfect phrase for it. Um, and even in relation to what you're talking about there in terms of the Valdez passing, I, I remember even as, as, re, or sorry, as late as three years into Guardiola's spell at Barca, they played Real Madrid in December 2011 and beat them 3-1. And they were 1-0 down early in that game. And I remember even that game, Sky had the rights to I think Neville was basically, he was rhapsodising about, even though Barca were 1-0 down and Benzema was regularly pressuring um, Valdez, it was the, Mar the Mourinho's Madrid, mm. they st still played it out. But he still had the courage to kind of take the be calm and play it to a centre half. And, and sorry to interrupt, that was used, it's amazing, your recall is incredible, that was used in the video. Valdez gives away the first goal personally by playing the ball straight to, I think it was Benzema, under pressure, and then in the film last night, it cut to three minutes later, the ball goes back yeah. to Valdez, serious pressure, and he doesn't even think about kicking it long, it's the same pattern. And there was an example of a player who had kicked it long in one of the games and Guardiola whipped him off at half time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and in fact, well, uh, we had a bit of a kind of a, a lunch with City about three years ago when they were talking about Guardiola. This was in the, the season they got 100 points. They were talking about Guardiola's uh, development of John Stones, which is obviously he's declined a bit since. But that season, Stones was good. And spoke about a similar thing. He kept telling the John Stones, no matter what anyone does, no matter what anyone says, never punt the ball forward. You punt the ball forward, you're out of the team. You play it, even if you make a mistake, you stay in it. But, but even in that context, I suppose... So as, re as recently as 2011, that still felt somewhat outlandish and still so brave. Whereas now, I mean, just look at the, the last FA Cup semi-final we had, Arsenal and Manchester, Manchester City, where Arsenal, a team that maybe had been pilloried for kind of some of that chaotic defending recently, still had the courage to kind of play that sort of approach against a team like City mm -hmm. and scored a goal from it. And yeah, you're right, it's, it's right down through the divisions now, right across Europe. It has become the standard. And it is why I think, I mean, you referenced that, that documentary, but why... Guardiola's appointment at Barca was basically the most influential moment in modern football yeah. since probably, I mean, you're yeah. talking about Saki's Milan. And because I suppose what it was, was a reimagining and re a modern reinterpretation of what, what Saki did at Milan, but taking it to a much higher level. And that's now kind of permeated right down through the game. It kind of governs youth coaching. But you, you were, I mean, that's the thing. You wonder about whether there might be a slight sense that some games are getting a little bit too samey in that regard. Um, but, but then I suppose what we want is, well, I what, you, what, what a lot of people want, I'd say, is maybe constant goal mouth action, which pressing at least does in that sense. Yeah, it's true. It's true, yeah, it's true. It's I mean, true. The, the, we, what, what's the alternative? Like Mourinho is about like, as close to an outlier at the moment, and it's not like that's great football to watch. Um, it's fascinating to see where it goes. I mean, yeah, you're, I totally agree on the Guardiola point. And you suspect there's more in this goalkeeping position. I'm, I'm pretty sure the next stage is they're going to be really talented 15, 16 year olds who've played outfield all their life and have incredible feet and dribbling skills but not good enough and they'll be converted somehow into goalkeepers. It'll be like uh, one direction, you know, they were almost there but come together in a different way um, so who knows where we go um, On the transfer window so we've about 10 weeks like, like sometimes when we've spoken to you down the years there's almost a, a trigger move of sorts amongst the elite clubs, which will suddenly be a lifting of the dam and money will start sloshing around. Is there an obvious one this summer? Like, the, the, the sense is because of COVID, we're heading into a transfer window, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. I, um, I don't think a, a, an obvious one where all the cards fall because we're, the market is somewhat dependent on almost a potluck of who makes a big move. Because if you if you look at it right now, basically, from, from agents I've spoken to who are obviously involved in a lot of negotiations and that, everyone is saying that, but, so in the Premier League, for example, the 20 clubs, they will look to do business, but it will be mostly be loans or part exchanges. Right. Now, in right. saying that, there are about three clubs that can, that can spend money, and who are Chelsea, obviously, because they had so much saved from the transfer ban and not spending in January, Manchester United and Manchester City. So basically, what it comes down to, I mean, it really, it's, it's got, it's, I think it's going to be these very focused trickle-down effects where, say, 
say, for example, if Manchester United did go and spend 50 to 60 million on Jack Grealish, then suddenly Villa have that 50, 60 million to spend. And because the market is so depressed this summer, it means that, that 60 million is maybe worth more this summer than, say, 90 million last summer. Um, so I think it's going to be dependent on those sort of moves. But there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think the, the, the state of the market is contributing to that as well. Uh, like the, the big deal that will happen is uh, Jaden Sancho from Dortmund to United. And like from what I've heard about that, Dortmund see it. They want to sell this summer because they don't think they'll get as good a price again uh, due to kind of Sancho's contract. In fact, I think the the window will, or the market will be suppressed for some time after this. So I think this is going to be an optimum time to sell. But well, that will be the big move. I think Dortmund are too prudent to put that straight into like basically to spend all that money. I mean, they've already got um, two signings, like Jude Bellingham, obviously, and there's the guy from Werder Bremen whose name now escapes me. But ultimately, Dortmund will use that money basically to reinforce their own infrastructure rather than putting it straight into the market. Whether where it was some, if it was some English clubs, they put it straight into the market. But, but I think that's what's going to, we're going to see little chains throughout the transfer market. But like uh, another one example, if, if City get Napoli's Caladou Koulibaly and in Italy, apparently, they, they think that will happen. Right. Then that will cause a kind of a chain there where Napoli buy someone, right. whoever, yeah. I was reading your piece on the London Independent and you were saying Barcelona, Madrid, Juve, they don't have much to spend. I mean, it's, it's, it's very unusual. It, it, it seems like the two Manchester clubs, uh, maybe Chelsea thrown in, they, they would be the big spenders in European football. I don't know where PSG are at. Well, PSG as well, they've already had a card in and they've still got money, um, obviously being what they are. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and that's actually an unprecedented situation, really. One that probably hasn't almost been given enough kind of thought. That the idea that Real Madrid and Barca, who are basically the biggest of the great white sharks in this sea, mm. and they're not doing any business. Like, it's, it's incredible. No no marquee signing from both. That must be the first time in history. Like, I don't have that to hand, but I'd imagine that's the case. And that, and that obviously... Again, I, feel, I feel like there's a London independent piece brewing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we go. There's something for, just before the Champions League. <laughs> but but it, 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 it must be the case. And I, that doesn't just affect the market then. It, all, it also affects kind of, like, I think this is quite an interesting thing as well, that it's going to affect tra the trajectories of players' careers. I mean, an obvious one is Paul Pogba. If he had his way, he'd be going to Madrid this summer. Now he has to kind of completely reassess what he's going to do just as he comes into his prime years. Uh, and I, that could be, I mean, again, obviously, when we talk about this, we obviously have to put it in the the real life context of COVID is all trivial compared to that, but it could be one of, one of the other effects of this whole crisis that it changes the careers of a lot of prime players. Yeah, no, the Pogba one's incredible. His fortunes, uh, a complete U-turn effectively. And as soon as you mentioned Pogba and United, have you had through your contacts any sense of the business they are prioritising? Um, well, Sancho is the main one. They want a wing forward. They want a central midfielder. Uh, and apparently... Solskjaer had gone cool on Grealish, but now having seen how the last few weeks panned out and how stretched the squad was behind his best 11, he's willing to go for him. The, the issue is they basically they can't guarantee Grealish first-team football every single week because of Pogba and um, Fernandez. Uh, so whether they'll be willing to go as high if it was essentially kind of the 12th man uh, remains to be seen. Uh, Thiago could offer us a, a bit of solution there, given he's going to be available for 30 million and he's absolute quality, really. Um, they're also, uh, they they may consider a strike United. Jimenez from Wolves has been mentioned. And I suppose after that, they're going to see what the lie of the land is with a centre half. If they see, the, if they think the Calib or Koulibaly is available, they may challenge City for him. They've also been having a look at Nathan Aki. But then they'd rather spend money elsewhere and if if they do that, they're kind of content to give Axel Twanzebi a chance. And it was mentioned to me the other day, there's even a, there's even a possibility that uh, Chris Smalling comes back from Roma uh, because he's done quite well there. Right. And are Liverpool going to sit tight, happy as they are? It, it really seems that way, unless... Because everything you keep hearing is that they don't have money to spend, which is actually interesting in a sense, given they've left two, not first-teamers, but like fairly prominent squad members in Lalana and Lovren go. Like, players that have stepped in. Yeah. They all, all be good at the third centre-half or the midfielder who comes in. Uh, so, obviously, Klopp... I mean, the phrase we've heard is they're going to promote from within, and there is some good young talent coming through. But, it, it, I mean, it does feel like they run a slight risk there of losing some of the momentum, given this will be the kind of 
the second summer where they haven't signed. Mm. Uh, we're right up against the clock, so I, I haven't left enough time for this, really. Very briefly, the cast full judgment is in. From what I've seen without having read it, the phrases not uh, insufficient evidence and time barred were used liberally across the 92 pages. Yeah, it's also, I mean, I spent about two hours yesterday going through it. It's not an easy read. <laughs> the glamour. Uh, yeah, uh, I th- and it's one of those as well. If you're of a city persuasion, you there's enough in it for you to see it as full vindication of them and a complete exoneration. If you're coming out from the other uh, perspective, I think there's enough in it to have real questions about the club. Um, Tony Evans for us today, he did, he did a piece saying he felt the, the onus should be on UEFA and how they failed in this case, that they failed to pursue what, what they should have done. Um, Nick, Har- Nick Harris did a great thread last night as well, I saw, yeah. Um, yeah. Qu- questioning the nature of um, the, these sponsorship deals despite this. Uh, and what was some, someone in legal terms put it to me yesterday that the whole thing basically feels like a case of it doesn't really exist in English law, but it's in Scottish law. It's a case of not proven rather than innocent. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yeah. Nick Harris's thread is very interesting. Etihad, for people who haven't seen this, that you can take in this much information if you're not going to read the whole thing. They had an initial 10 year, 350 million deal with City, which was valid through to 2021, Etihad. And they chose to negotiate it upwards four different times between 2013 and 16, which would strike you as an unusual practice if you're Etihad, but um, there were plenty of yeah. unusual practices. Miguel, I'll let you go. Sorry, sorry. Final word to you. Yeah. The, the one thing I've always thought in all this, and I think almost the FFP thing has almost been a little bit overplayed. Well, not overplayed, but really this whole debate and issue is really a symptom of what should be a much greater question, which is what exactly City are and how their owners treat the club and how they, how they see the club and how they see the game, um, which is essentially the use for a, a state project. And I think this, and it, it's almost felt like that's been sidelined throughout all, all this discussion. Uh, and it should be a much bigger question for football and a, a much more difficult question, especially in relation to the Newcastle thing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent as always. Thanks so much. I know you're crazy busy at the moment. So, Miguel Delaney, London Independent. Thanks, Emil. Much appreciated. Yep. Now, Harry Arter. Harrison Reed to his right. Ben Watson in his way. It's Harry Arter again. Majestic. Magical. The goal was dreams. Wow, wow, wow. 25 yards out, Harry Arter. That was a very important goal for Fulham about three weeks ago now against Nottingham Forest and has put them in part into the playoffs. They are up against Cardiff tomorrow. They have a two-goal lead in their Craven Cottage tomorrow. Very happy to say Harry Arter, the man who scored that goal and who's been on the show multiple times, is with us again. Harry, thanks for the time. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks, guys. Yourself? Yeah, very well. Great to have you with us. I know you're injured at the moment. We might as well relive that goal for a second. It was a beauty. Yeah, it's one of those. You, they probably said it right in commentary. You, you know, as a as a midfielder and someone that doesn't score too many, um, you know, it's nice to just get on the score sheet anyway. But you know, it was an important game, uh, an important time of the season, and you know, I was I was really happy with the strike. So it was, it was a good night. Suddenly, I mean, the games keep coming, don't they? And the stakes get higher and higher. So you're in the midst of playoffs at the moment and it's Cardiff's second leg tomorrow. I know you're injured. Is it a bad injury or just a niggle or where are you? It's kind of probably in between a, a niggle and a, a more so bad injury. It's just that the timing's not great because of the, the quick turnaround. Um, you know, everyone's aware of the, the schedule that we've we've had to have been faced, um, you know, post-coronavirus and... You know, it's been a big ask for, for every club to, you know, kind of deal with the situation and, and within that, you know, deal with the injuries. And unfortunately for me, it was only last week um, I picked up a, a little injury. And in, norm, in normal circumstances, there's there's usually a, a break between the end of the season and the playoffs. And if there was a, you know, a two-week break, I, I would be fine. But, you know, it's going to be push and go. But fingers crossed I, I could make the final. It's been a weird season, obviously, by normal circumstances. How have you been going generally? We'll get, we'll get to lockdown in a second, but I know you've played 28 times this year, which is a decent size. 
Yeah, it's been um, it's been a good season. One that you know I've I've really enjoyed. One we're in a position now where you know we're two games away from what our our goal was at the start of the season. Um, of course, the the manner of the season kind of you know makes it you know a completely different sort of feel to the season that you, that I'm used to. Um, you know the break um, around March time and then returning only you know a month or six weeks ago. It was a it's such a difficult you know, season and, and, you know, from a physical side, trying to manage yourself, it, it's been difficult. Um, I just felt like I was getting a run of games, you know, up post uh, my injury that I had earlier in the season and, and it comes to a halt. So that part of it was disappointing, but um, the position we're in as, as a team is, is one that, you know, we would have took at the start of the season and one that we're really looking forward to hopefully finishing on a high. I read you hit the roads and did lots of running during lockdown. Yeah, that probably um, that probably didn't help me to be honest, because as footballers and all players would be aware, you know, the surfaces that we're used to at, at training grounds and, and games, you know, the, the pitches are like carpet, and I think your body kind of, you know, gets used to that sort of surface, and then you're out road running, and you know, your your body's not overly used to it, and you pick up little niggles. But that was that was a position every player faced themselves in. You know, all mm. the gyms were shut. Uh, training grounds were, were off limits, so it was it was back to the real old school of, of road running and and just trying to you know keep yourself fit. What were you clocking up on a good day? Uh, the best I got up to was twelve kilometers, which for me, you know, gone are the days now where you know pre seasons about distance and and doing them long slog runs. It's all short sharp stuff. So I feel my era kind of missed that sort of pre season phase, and I, I'm quite thankful for that to be honest. But <laughs> It was quite nice to, you know, have a different sort of training. It was completely put on by, you know, the individuals, really. Um, there was no one monitoring it, so it was it was down to yourself. And, you know, I've never been really a long road runner, sort of. Yeah, I've never really enjoyed that side, but I kind of got into it and I started to really enjoy, mm. you know, the, the road running and the long distance stuff. It was, it was something different and, and something I enjoyed. Why Fulham this year as opposed to staying at Bournemouth? How does that decision happen? Uh, do you know what? It's when you're when you're on loan. I said it last year when I was at Cardiff. You know, I was asked the same question whether I was going to stay there. And you know, when I'm at a club and, and when I'm signed there, and we've got a, a goal, you know, I don't really think about my future really. Um, you know, the teams um, and the clubs' end goal is much bigger than what what for what's going to happen for me, uh, to me next year. So I, I honestly haven't thought about it. It was disappointing. Bournemouth got got relegated I was you know praying that perfect season would have been Fulham getting promoted and, and Bournemouth staying up um, but as of the minute you know I'm contracted to Bournemouth and so I've got a very good relationship with the club there and mm. if it doesn't work out here at Fulham or it doesn't you know suit both parties then there's, there's no problem going back to Bournemouth. And Harry how does it work that you go out on loan again at the end of your season on loan at Cardiff do you go back to Bournemouth and chat with Eddie Howe and he says, listen, there might not be enough regular football for you. Maybe you should go out and loan again. Or is it is it your suggestion? How do you arrive at the, at the decision after your year at Cardiff to go out and loan again? Well, I really enjoyed the year at Cardiff. And, you know, it was out of my comfort zone for what I've been used to for, for eight years. Um, I think naturally the, the season that I had before Cardiff, it was it was quite obvious that, you know, I had to probably have a change of scenery for for all different reasons, really. Um, but from just a football side, it was something that I wanted to experience and something that I really enjoyed at, at Cardiff. Mm. Um, and to be honest, my my mindset was to to go back to, to Bournemouth and carry on my journey there. Um, I was more than happy to prepare to fight my way back into the team. Right. Um, but then, you know, the, the, this move come around and it's obvious that, you know, the attraction, it being working under someone that I've looked up to and, um, someone that's been in my life from such a young boy to to be able to uh, to be able to work under Scott and learn from him from a um, from a football point of view was something that I really wanted to try um, at a club that you know had you know and still have got really strong ambitions to get in the Premier League and to be part of that I was really excited about and mm. um, it was kind of the only move that I probably would have made this summer um, based on what you know I had available to me um, and I made that clear to Bournemouth and, and Eddie. You know, totally got it. He understood and he thought it would be a great move for me and something that I'd really enjoy. Okay. This is Scott Parker, obviously, you're talking about. So he's an in-law, is that right? Yeah, he's married to uh, my sister. 
Okay, so you've known him a long time. Yeah, they've been they've been together since if I can remember. To be honest, to say he's been a huge influence on my life. Um, you know, obviously seeing him grow up as uh, a model professional uh, when he was a player, mm. um, someone that achieved you know at a point of being a young boy, only I could dream of really. Um, mm. So naturally, he was someone I always looked up to, and as I said, they're a model professional, which. Um, I didn't really have to ask much of him. It was more just look at how he lives his life, how he prepares for game, and mm. um, you know, I learned a lot of him growing up. Because he went to Chelsea, obviously, he got that big move, and it's very easy at Chelsea when there's so many quality players to not make an absolutely massive impact. But you think back to the football he was playing, which got him that move. He was as good as any midfielder going in the league, and model professional is exactly the phrase I'd use to describe him as well. We, we can kind of us underestimate how good a player he was. Well, yeah, I grew up probably being biased because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, you know, that's fair, that's I, fair I him, Of course, I wanted to see him and always see him as, in my opinion, the best player whenever I watch. But um, obviously, I never got to work with him, never got to play with him as a, as a player. I uh, only appreciate it from, from afar. Um, so this season, you know, even when I come in here, he's sometimes joining training. And <laughs> I don't know whether this is a massive compliment to him or it doesn't sound too good on the Fulham lads, but he's by far by far the best player in the little small side of games and I always point out right. to him I'm like when you come in you're like you're the best player and he, he, he takes it modestly and he, he says if he got to a bigger pitch he, he would soon struggle but even in the in the small stuff and the little five sides his, mm. his, his quality was you know top and of course he had a top career to back that up so it's no surprise to me really um, but no he was a he was a top player and someone that all the midfielders at Fulham, um, I've, I've definitely learned off and try and gain every information off him. Um, and he, he's there to help everyone. I would suspect you enjoy the football he's trying to play as well. It's very much possession-based. I think Fulham across the championship have had the second highest percentage of possession and certainly attempt the most passes. On all the stats, it points to possession-based football. So I suspect that's right in your wheelhouse rather than trucking up and down the pitch with the ball going over your head. Yeah, he had a um, he had a clear philosophy and identity of how he wanted to become successful as a manager, and I'm always quite um, you know adverse to to saying one style works and one style doesn't. I think you know when you get it right, ball possession is without doubt the most prettiest and and in my opinion the best way to play football. But as a manager, I think you have to you know identify what your team's strengths are. Um, you know, I look at Cardiff as an example. Last season when we went up. And I joined there. It was, you know, obvious from the outset that we wasn't going to be such a, a, a possession-based team. Mm. And I, I genuinely believe that was the best um, best chance for us to stay up as a team. Mm. Um, if we had went toe to toe with some of the teams in the league, um, you know, I'm, I know we ended up getting relegated, but I don't think it, we would have put up as much of a fight as we did. Um, and same here at Fulham. You know, it could have easily gone another way. Scott could have decided to go long ball, but he, he looked at the players we've got. Um, the technical side of our team is, is very high and it would definitely suits the style of players that we got. So I think, you know, the style is important, but it's more based on what your, your individuals that you've got in your team are suited to. When will you decide on your future? I, I, I presume in some ways it's dependent on Bournemouth, it's dependent on whether Fulham get up to the Premier League or not. So there's a lot of ifs, buts and maybes there. Do you have any idea what will happen next season just yet? Honestly, I, ha I haven't got a clue. The the, the deal initially was um, I had to make uh, 30 starts for Fulham and if they got promoted, there was some sort of automatic um, uh, deal triggered. But that obviously isn't going to happen now um, just through the lack of starts. So it would be, you know, a, a decision that's out of my hands. Um, one that, you know, I think the business side of football this summer is going to be uh, a lot lower than it has been in previous years mm. for obvious reasons. And, how quick the turnaround is from, you know, the season ended, especially us being in the playoffs to, you know, the start date of pre-season. I think we're looking at the 17th or the 20th of August, which, you know, is literally two weeks um, from from when we finish. So I think anyone involved in a transfer, they know nine times out of ten, it, it, it takes more than a week, two weeks, three weeks. So as a as an individual, I'm just trying to, you know, detach myself from from that situation. I feel lucky I've got you know, a contract, you know, at Bournemouth that I can go back to. I'm not worried about that side of things, which, you know, sadly, a lot of players are going to be in a position this year where 
you know, they haven't got a contract. And mm. as I said there, the, the financial implications of, of what coronavirus has done is going to, you know, really hit a lot of people hard. So I'm not, I'm not thinking selfishly at all. It's, it's more just I want to try and play a part in Fulham going up and, and then taking it from there. And how's your game? How's your form? How are you feeling about things? Yeah, it's, it's so difficult when you're injured because, especially with games so quick and you, and you, you feel like there's probably um, not a good chance of, of being 100% fit, especially for tomorrow night. There's, there's obviously no way I'm not in the squad. And it's kind of just trying to get my head around hoping and, and, and working hard to be available for the final. So it's kind of, it is difficult because every player wants to be playing. It's, it's the worst part of being a footballer when you're injured. And I feel fortunate it's only a, a little sort of injury compared to some of the injuries you can get. So I'm, I'm, I'm staying positive, um, hoping the lads can can obviously do it on Thursday. And mm. I've been pleased with been pleased with the last, you know, six or seven games. Right. Um, we hit a real good bit of form as a team and it's always good to be part of a team that's, that's winning. Irish fans will obviously want to know, are we going to be seeing you again anytime soon? Stephen Kenny name-checked you. Recently, he was doing a press conference over here as somebody that would be more than welcome back. And even that Nottingham Forest goal that we played, Keith Andrews was actually on co-commentary that day. So that was a handy game for him to catch. I presume you're keen to come back and get into an Irish shirt again down the line. Yeah, I've said it before, you know, playing for Ireland is, without doubt, one of my, my greatest achievements as a, as a player. Um, you know, forget where the journey that I've, I've had to get to that. You know, even if I would have started off in the Premier League and, and was able to to play for Ireland at international um, senior level, it would have been something that I'd always dreamed of. So never would I close the door on it, um, especially not after speaking to to Stephen. Um, I think he he done the rounds with the players and spoke to you know the players that were involved with with Mick, and it was nice to to be involved in that. Um, he seemed keen to you know hopefully get me over. Um, fitness related and, and form related really mm. um, he certainly made no promises about you know being in the squad playing nothing like that it was kind of to see where I was at what kind of went wrong in the last year or so um, he totally understood where I was coming from and, and as I say he, the fact that he said it to you guys in the press he only echoed that to me and, and said you know he'd like to me to come back over so it was something I was really thankful for and, and without doubt excited about yeah, because remind me, had you been in much under Mick? Um, I was in the first squad, um, and I kind of just got the feel. And, and Mick was was honest. Mick was great. Um, you know, I think he had his mindset on you know the midfield that he was favourable to yeah. uh, if they were fit. Um, and I just felt you know I didn't want to go over to to make the numbers up. I remember the call with Mick. I, I kind of just said, "I'm always here. You know, if you need me." Um, if you need me to play and be in the squad, I'm always going to be here. But if you feel like, you know, there isn't a chance of me playing and you should put me in the squad because of I've been in it previously and, and you don't want to, you know, upset me in a way, um, then please don't do that. Look at the younger players that, you know, would love the experience of just travelling with the lads um, and especially just joining Fulham. You know, the season's so cramped in the Championship. You have so many games. Right. Um, Mick totally understood that. He knew that I was on loan and, I needed to try and, you know, help Fulham go up. Um, and, you know, we left it on good terms. He said, listen, if there's an injury, um, then I know I can call on you. And, you know, we, we was happy with that arrangement. OK, that's very interesting to hear because from afar, if I was to just put it in blunt terms, it, I, I suspect I wasn't the only one who had wondered this. There was the very high-profile situation with Roy and that leaked out and that seemed very nasty and, like, no fun for you at all. And I just wondered if largely because of that and then maybe you felt you weren't mixed cup of tea you had just thought i'm kind of done here this ain't happening i'm i'm, I'm just going to let my irish career drift out to sea a bit i'm not that you know it, it it had sullied the thing for you well i think the the the, the last few years playing for ireland has been you know a difficult one for me um on the pitch really more than more than anything i don't feel like i've i've given a, an account of myself that i come off the pitch entirely happy with um a new manager coming in, um, I just sensed it that he, I wasn't someone that he see as first choice or even second or third or fourth. And mm. um, I'm sort of glad that when I went over there, I tried my hardest, trained well, and it was more of a case of just having an honest chat with Mick. Mm. Um, you know, 
So it wasn't as it wasn't as a result of the previous issues with with Roy and all no. that. No, no, definitely not. Because to be fair, the, the first game Mick played, he, he brought me on against Rebota, mm. um, um, and then we played Georgia, and he went to the free midfield, and I didn't play. And you know, them lads that I played were brilliant throughout that campaign, Glenn, Connor, and Jeff. Mm. Um, and then we had some really good young lads coming through. I know Josh done really well um, in the in the friendlies, Alan Brown. So it wasn't even a case of you know, me saying I don't want to be here because, you know, Mick, by all, you know, he could have easily not picked me based on form, based on his own decision. Um, and I just didn't want to, I kind of didn't want to put him in that position, really. I, I felt he respected me a lot when I went over the first time. Um, and I felt I owed him that respect that I wouldn't necessarily just want to go over to make the numbers up. Um, uh, being 30 years old now and and being part of the island setup for the last six years, um, and more so just the amount of games there is in the championship. Um, I just didn't want to just be that number or yeah. that person that Mick felt like he had to put in because I've been in the squad previously. And as I say, you know, he was great with great with me on the phone. Um, and he knew I was always going to be there if needed. And um, I know he, oh, I'd like to think that he felt like he could count on me if, if, if I did get a call. I, I, well, that's, that's, that's um, good to hear. And it, it's a very honest thing of you to say that you feel you haven't, given a good account of yourself in an Irish jersey. Any reason as to why or things just haven't clicked on certain nights for you? Did you did you feel like you you did put in some performances you were very happy with in an Irish shirt down the years? I look back at my, my early games, you know, friendlies, a few friendlies I've done well. Um, the build up to the Euros, yeah. the one that I had to put out on, you know, I was really pleased with them performances. And you know, I've only played 15 times, so I've been involved for the last know six years now so 15 times is, is not as many caps as I, I would like anyway to be honest mm. um, but I feel the latter part of of, of Martin's reign um, and there's no fault of anyone other than myself I, I, I feel the older I've got the more I've realized that as a player you have to take full responsibility for, for your performance um, it's no good blaming anyone else I'm the one who's out on the pitch I'm the one who's been asked to deliver the goods and if I don't do it then it's no one's fault other than mine so um, you know I take full responsibility for you know especially the last couple of years or maybe the last you know five or six games mm. under under mine I wasn't happy with it at all you know whatever that could be obviously me and Roy had the, the alteration that was quite obvious and plain for everyone to see um, and was that did you did you, re did you regard that as a big deal I regarded it as a, a lack of respect, um, purely for no reason, to be honest. Um, you know, I, it's not something that I would like to go back onto, but, you know, at the time it was uncalled for. I'm not the sort of lad that would ever um, fake an injury. And the, the ironic thing about it was that it was in the middle of the summer. I could have been on, it was when we played France and USA, and it was in the middle of the off season. So, you know, I was thinking to myself, if I'm faking an injury, I wouldn't be sitting in the hotel. The last thing I want to be doing is sitting in a hotel, injured, when I'm in the middle of my summer. So um, it was just, a, I guess it was a misunderstanding. Um, you know, Roy got it totally wrong um, with why he thought I was injured or maybe the injury itself. He didn't realise the extent of what it was. Um and I genuinely now put it down to misunderstanding. Right. Um, I know he's done a few interviews since, and he's name checked me and 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 Stephen Ward and and John Walters. But you know, it's something that I would never want to get involved in. It's, it is what it is. I've always tried my hardest. Um, I wasn't prepared to let someone accuse me of faking an injury. And if you look at it from an obvious outset, if I'm faking an injury, I wouldn't be doing it in the off season when I could be on holiday. I would. Um, I certainly wouldn't be sitting in a hotel in Dublin. I would be on a beach somewhere enjoying the sun. So um, mm. I was disappointed with with that whole situation. But you know, for me, me and Roy spoke about it. A good four or five months after, and to me, it was it was finished. Right. Okay. So you did speak and you did put it to bed. Yeah, put it to bed. Yeah, I, I made it clear to my me and Roy hadn't spoke. Um, I didn't want to go home mid-trip. I was really disappointed with with, with being accused of that. Um, I decided just to not cause a fuss. Uh, I didn't want to storm out or anything like that. Um, so I stayed for the rest of the trip. 
Um, even though I made it clear to Martin that I wasn't happy with it, out of respect to, to Martin more than anyone, to be honest. Um, I didn't want to just leave midway through um, the week before the game, so I decided to stay and I kind of made a decision then that, you know, I'm, I need to take a time away from this. I, something I wasn't prepared to accept at the time. Mm. Um, and then eventually me and Roy got round to speaking and it was it was done. Right, OK. So you did you had a good relationship with Martin by the sounds of things? Yeah, I, you know, Martin gave me my, my debut um, when some managers easily wouldn't. I was only playing in the championship at the time, you know, off it. A good season with Bournemouth, of course, and, you know, I was really pleased with that year. Um, but I was so thankful for, for the opportunities he, he gave me. Um, some of our performances, as I said to you earlier, I don't feel was good enough, but I felt a real belief in Martin mm. um, towards me. Um, he put me in. Um, after performances that potentially some managers wouldn't, um, put me in for probably one of the biggest games of my career um, against Wales. Um, and I'd like to feel I repaid him that night. And going back to the Euros, you know, I would have been in, according, you know, speaking to Martin before that, I would have been in the squad. So for him to put that trust in me, to put me in the squad, it was something I'd always respect. And um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed working with Martin. Yeah, it's the brutal side of football, isn't it? Like that you're putting in performances that you're not happy with yourself and it's not for the lack of trying. Like I'd say you're desperate more than anything to have a really good game and to play well and, you know, you couldn't be putting in any more effort and it's just not going your way. That can be a tricky thing to try and figure out. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, you've got to deal with it. You know, you've got a lot of time to, to assess your performances at international level because... You know, they only come round, you know, at best, you know, September, October and November. You know, that's obviously a month in between the games, but usually there's a there's a massive gap in between the games. So, you know, at club level, you can have a bad game and then, you know, three days later, you've got a, a game to put it right. So it's it's more difficult with the international side. Um, but it's something that, you know, international level is uh, a completely different experience to club level. So... Mm something that potentially I have to, you know, grasp better and, and try and assess better. And as I say, I always, I've always given my all for Ireland. Um, always tried to be there, you know, playing through, you know, injuries at times when potentially wasn't the right thing to do. Um, right, OK. But well, hopefully well, well, then I can see how you're a bit peeved when you're accused of being injured and, and or fake an injury. And look, that's... Even Roy himself didn't react well to being accused of that. Was that relationship generally OK? Was that, or was that an ongoing issue for you? Um, no, I didn't think there was, you know, any problems <laughs> with Roy until until that trip. And then, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn because sure. I don't know whether Roy's just said he got the wrong end of the stick and, you know, sometimes he can go overboard. Um, whether he was just saying that just to, you know, get me back into the squad and, you know, all the media side stuff was, was closed on it. But, you know, he seemed um, genuine that, you know, he, he accepted that the situation he might have read wrong. Um, okay, fair enough. So, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to think that was put to bed. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And look, it's the world of football as well, a little bit. That's kind of, I'm sure it's not the first or last time someone screamed at you in the last 15 years. No, exactly. And, you know, I've always, you know, from day to day, you, you have massive fallouts with, with players, with managers, you, and you put it to bed. Um, I just felt there was a line overstepped, and as a as a person, I was wasn't accept, wasn't willing to accept the, the situation I was put in. So that that was it from me. I just, as I say, managers have, have had a go at me before. Um, but I just felt it got too personal, and I wasn't ready to. I wasn't accepting it. Yeah, fair enough. Well, listen, that's a couple of years ago now. Hopefully, things go well for. Fulham tomorrow, you get the body back in order and, and maybe there's Premier League football or something on the horizon. Either way, we might see you around Ireland camp in the not-so-distant future, but for the time being, Harry, thanks for the time. Much appreciated. No worries. Thank you very much.